It's, uh, as always, it's great uh, to see everyone out this morning. Um, I know not necessarily it's a requirement uh, to enjoy worship, uh, but I certainly did enjoy worshiping with you this morning, enjoyed Bible class, and, and I enjoy this time that I, that I got an opportunity to share with you something from God's Word. I've, uh, every time I get done with my sermon, I go and I stand back there. And why usually I go back there is because Mr. Rick is going to give me my time. And he'll tell me 30 minutes, 22 seconds. Or sometimes 45 minutes, 22 seconds. Uh, and I've been noticing it, and I watch it, uh, that I've been kind of leading towards the 50-minute mark lately. Uh, I've been getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer every day. And, and some of you are going to come up to me and say, Andrew, time doesn't matter. Do what you need to do, and you mean it. And some people are going to come up to me and say, Andrew, time doesn't matter just because you're trying to be nice. Uh, time does matter because I can only hold your attention for so long uh, in a lot of different respects. But what I did this week is I wrote my sermon, and I went back and I gutted it. And I got rid of everything that I don't think, that I thought was not vital to the message took away everything and cut away anything that really you didn't have to know to understand the message. And this is what this sermon is. It's just what you need to know. Now the reason why I said that is because when I present this message, there is absolutely no reason to zone out. It's not going to be a long message. There's really not that much to it. But there's no reason to be thinking about other things. There's no reason to be looking out the window. There's no reason to think about what you're going to eat for lunch. Please just give me your attention just for right now. And that's all that I ask. If you can stay engaged with me, I believe you're going to get a lot out of this sermon. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles with me, and I'd like to see you open up your Bibles and actually read this with me, but 2 Samuel 21, we have a story and account of atonement. What it means to be atoned for sins. And what you'll see as we read this is this is a shadow of, of things to come. And all that we're going to do this morning is make the application of what is the substance of the shadow that we see here in 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21, there's been a famine in the land. And a famine in the land for three years. And what David's going to do is David's going to ask God, why is there this famine? Why do I have people starving to death? And we'll read this now. Verse 1 of chapter 21. Now there was a famine in the days of David... For three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, the children of Israel and the sworn protection to them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, and as the man who consumed us, the plotting against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants to be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord and give of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Melphibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Amrona and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up from Adriel, the son of Brazila, the Maholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest." Now Rizba, the daughter of Ai, took Sathcock and spread it for himself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured down from them in heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day or the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rizba, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. 
Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son and the men of Jabesh Gilead that had stolen them from the street of Bashan, where the Philistines had hung them up. After the Philistines had struck down Saul in Geboa. And he brought the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of Kish his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. So what we have here, just to quickly review what we just read, to make sure we all understand what just happened. But we did have the famine in the land, and this famine was for three years, year after year, as Samuel says. And you can imagine what this would be like. This would be like having a famine since 2012. It's a long time to be having a famine. And what I technically believe, and I'll explain this later, I personally believe that this famine was caused by a drought. That it, there was no water, there was no food growing, and therefore they had no food. Food was scarce. So David inquires, Lord, why is this happening? Why is there a famine for three years? It's a very long time and a normal time to be having a famine. So the Lord tells David why they're having famine. It is a punishment for Saul, even though Saul had been dead by this point. It's a punishment for Saul for slaying the Gibeonites. And what we see there in verse 2, that Saul, he took his wrath out on them because of his zeal for the children of Israel. In Judah. Well, who were the Gibeonites? If you remember, we actually talked about the Gibeonites a couple of weeks ago in Joshua 9. Joshua, we talked about being gullible, and Joshua was, was tricked by the Gibeonites to make an alliance, an oath with them. The Gibeonites dressed up like they were travelers from really far away, and God had already told Joshua to kill everyone in the land. But these people said that they were not from the land. So they made the oath, they made the alliance, and then Joshua finds out a little while later that they actually belonged in the land. So even though it was not what they were supposed to do, God expected the people of Israel to keep their covenant with the Gibeonites. So they were supposed to, but Saul apparently did not. And Saul was bloodthirsty, and Saul slew the Gibeonites. So David wants to make it all right. David wants to reconcile the Israelites with the Gibeonites. And he asked them the question in verse 3, With what should I make atonement? Atonement meaning to reconcile, to propitiate, or the root word there, to atone. How do I make this okay? How do I repay for what Saul has done for you so this famine can be released? And the Gibeonites tell him that they want seven sons. Seven sons of Saul to be hung before the Lord. And through the lives of those seven sons, the Israelite as a nation will be atoning for these sins of Saul. And we see that this thing actually does work because we see at the end, we read in verse 14, that God began to hear the prayers of the Israel nation for the land. Something that he had been refusing to do until these seven lives were given. And what we see in verse 10 is a woman named Rispah. Rispa is only talked about there in verse 10 for what she did. We see her other in 2 Samuel 3, but she was just a concubine of Saul. She was probably she lived a pretty good life as a concubine of Saul, but up until that point, maybe wouldn't that special of a person, except she had two of Saul's children. And these were her two sons. Now what David did is David takes Rispa's two sons and five of Saul's grandchildren from Michael, and that is who she delivers up to the Gibeonites for them to kill. So Rispa, of course, is in utter shock that this has happened. So Rispa there, she lays out a sackcloth on the rock, and she just sits there and protects her son's bodies. And she's out there, and she won't let any birds get close to the son's bodies. She won't let the beasts, the the wolves, the, the wild dogs, she won't let anyone get close to their son's bodies. And she stays out there from harvest until the late rain season. We don't know how long that was. It could have been weeks. It could have been months. But she just lived out there and protected the bodies. And I believe the reason why she protected the bodies is because it's the last thing she could do. She couldn't save her sons. They were already gone. She couldn't get her sons away because David took them. David didn't ask if he could have those sons. He just took them in verse 8. So all she could do was protect the bodies. I'm just going to try to keep them the way they are for as long as I can. And she demonstrates this love. And David hears about it. It's known that Rispa is doing this. So David goes and gets the bodies of Saul and Jonathan that the Philistines have taken. And he goes and gets the remains 
of the seven that were hung, and then goes and puts them in the tomb of Saul in the tribe of Benjamin. And this is the story that we see. Now, if you have know anything about the gospel of Christ, anything at all, you know why we're talking about this story. That this story is a shadow of what is to come. That you have that Saul needs to have his sins atoned. Everyone's being punished for it. What are we going to do about it? Well, seven innocent people are going to have to die to atone for the sins of Israel. And we look at Rizpah, and we see her up there, and she's standing there watching her sons hang from the tree. And what does that take us to? I believe this is supposed to take us to John 19.25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and the mother's sister Mary the wife of Clophis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold the Son. It takes us to the cross. That Jesus, who had to atone for the sins of you and me, had to go up and hang on a tree. And guess who had to watch the whole thing? His mother. His rispa had to sit there and watch it happen. And if you look at the story of the crucifixion, as Jesus goes up there, all the men left. Only the women stayed in their list. Now, John comes back later on. You can give him credit for that. But Mary stayed with them. And you maybe ask the question, well, why did Mary see the crucifixion? Why did Mary stay with Jesus? Well, for one, Mary had enough faith. But also, as Jesus' mother, where else would she go? Where else would she be than to be with her son? even in his worst moment. And go off this idea of hangs on a tree, that this is the way that the seven sons died. This is the way that Jesus is described as dying in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.24 Who himself, this is Jesus, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. We can compare this to what we see in the seven sons. There's famine in the land. The land needs healing. What healed the land? Well, it was the death of those seven sons. What heals us? Well, it's the death of Jesus Christ atoning for our sins, hung on the body of a tree. Also, it's used again in Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And why does it keep on using it as the word tree? Why is it using cross? I think it's for two reasons. He's referring to Deuteronomy 21. And we're going to read that later on, so don't turn there yet. But this is what we see in Deuteronomy 21. You have a disobedient son. What do they have to do? Well, they have to be hung on a tree. And what happens is, is because they're hung on a tree, they become accursed. Now, what Jesus did is that being in the law, and also I believe she's referring to Rispa. He's referring to these seven sons as well. They had to hold on to the curse of the land, the famine, the, the problem that had happened, to atone the land for their sins. So basically, they took on the curse of the land on themselves so that the land could be spared. So the Israelites could be spared from the sin that was committed. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So you can follow me here how this is an identical story, a shadow of what's to come. In Galatians as well, the Old Testament, what 2 Samuel 21 is in, is referred to as the master tutor. It's the teacher. It's what helps us better understand the things we see in the gospel account. Now, what I want to do is, is I want to connect the dots. I want to connect the shadow to the substance. And that's what we see in Colossians 2. That's what Paul describes it. That the Old Testament, the stories we read, the people we read about, are shadows of the substance of Christ. The best way I understand it, it is like a glove and a hand. The glove being the shadow and the hand actually being the substance. You can look at that glove and you can see that it's supposed to hold a hand. You can learn things about the hand from the glove, but it's not actually the hand. But when the hand slides in there perfectly... You understand it has a use. It has a purpose. Okay, this is a glove. This is the hand. And that's what you see in this story. So in verse 1, Saul, we see, was the one who actually slayed the Gibeonites. It's because of Saul that his house has become bloodthirsty. He sinned. He did something wrong. And that was the shadow. 
Well, who is that in the gospel story? That's you and me. We are the ones that actually committed the sin. And as well, I can say that it is the race of Adam. Adam committed the sin. By the time Jesus came, Adam was dead. Long ago. Yet he had come to forgive his father Adam and to forgive his mother Eve. Now this is what happens with the seven sons. Saul's dead. And five of these people are Saul's grandsons. Yet they are the ones that end up having to atone for the sin that was committed by Saul. Now who would be Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. And what we know is that because David made an oath with Jonathan and said, I'm going to take care of your household even though God is leaving, this is the ruling family. He's coming to me. And he ends up being that Mephibosheth is disabled. David finds that this is Jonathan's son, the one whom he loved. So he takes Mephibosheth in and he takes care of him. He says, from now on you're going to eat at my table and I'm going to take care of you. Well, we see in verse 7 that David decides to spare Mephibosheth because of the oath of the Lord. So in the sin that was committed, who is spared in the substance? Well, again, that's you and me. We really get the best of both worlds here. Because we can be the ones that are guilty of the sin, the one who did the wrong, yet also, as Mephibosheth, we're the one that is spared from the atonement. None of us had to die on the cross, did we? We already have forgiveness of sins now, and none of us have died. We're still alive here on this earth. Right there, we have been spared. Now, David is the one who did the sparing, so who would David be in the shadow, in the substance? David would be the Lord. That the Lord knew that there was a problem, and he corrected it. Now, for David in this famine, would this have been really his problem? I don't think it would have been. Number one, Saul's the one, the old kingdom is the one who committed the sin. David probably could have hid behind his wealth. He probably could have just gone and raided the Philistines if he was hungry. He could have done all these other things, but he sees the famine and he makes it his problem to protect his people, to protect God's people. And then he has the mercy to spare Mephibosheth. Who did that for us? God did that for us. When we sinned, it was our problem. He had nothing to do with it. But because he's our Lord, because he's our Father, he made it his problem. And he found someone to atone for our sins by sparing us. The same as David did to Melphibosheth. The seven sons, this one should be obvious. Who atoned for the people's sins? That would be Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ atoned for the sins of God's people. I was thinking about the seven sons and trying to relate to them. Not a lot is said about them. We know more about Rispa than we know about the seven sons. But you can imagine being one of these seven sons living in Israel. And there's just been this famine for three years. It's probably dry. You're hungry. And David comes and approaches you. The king comes and approaches you and says, We found a way to solve the famine problem. We found a way. But the thing is, is that you're going to have to die. I'm going to have to deliver you into people that are not Israelites, the Gibeonites, and they're going to hang you on a tree. You're going to be hung. What would you take that as? My first reaction would be, I would want to run. But David tells you, you can't run. Number one, I'm not going to let you run. But number two, you are the only thing that can save the people of Israel. The only one who can bear their sins. This is what the Gibeonites said would atone. This is what we have to do. So maybe for eventually at a point, you would make peace with it. You would have to understand, okay, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to do this for my brother. So they did. They died. And not only are you going to be hung, I don't want you to think that this is something from the movies. And I feel like the movies have really uh, just destroyed the idea of how terrible execution is. But this wasn't something where they're going to have this big galley and they're going to kick the back door and it was immediately going to break your neck. It, it probably was they just wrap a rope around you and they pull you up and you strangle to death. It, and that's what's going to happen to you to save the people. And then you think, well, I need to get my life in order. I need to make sure that everyone I need to take care of is okay. I need to do this. I need this. And I think eventually you start thinking, why is this happening to me? Why do I have to do this? This isn't fair. Who committed this sin? My granddad did. Why am I having to do it? Jesus knew this his whole life. His entire life, he knew that he was going to die for sins that he didn't commit. 
he was going to have to die for something that his granddaddy did. Yet he did it. Like a sheep going to his shears, he didn't complain. He didn't say, this isn't fair. He just went ahead and he did it. To save the land. To save the people. Rizpah should be obvious as well. We've already talked about it. Who is Rizpah in the substance? Rizpah is Mary. And we'll talk about this more in just a second. But you have the mother that has to bear the child, has to see the child go through this, has to take care of the child his entire life just to see him hung on a tree. And what she does is she protects the bodies enough to get the attention of David to give these people a proper burial because it's the only thing she could give to her children. At least now I can protect their bodies. It's the only option she had, so she did it. But I put Rispa up here twice because Mary wasn't the only one who had to watch their son die, was she? The Lord also had to watch his son die. He's the one that gave him up. And that's what we see in Galatians 4, 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. So when the time had come, when God knew that the fullness of time had come, this is the time to atone the people's sins, he sent his son, Born of Mary. So two people had to watch their son die that night. It just wasn't just Mary. But he was actually willing to give up his own son to atone for people who were not his sons at the, point, at the time. So that he could adopt others in. We were spared. And at the moment we were spared, we weren't even his children. Yet he still decided to spare us so we could become his children. Adopted in into the family of Abraham. As I looked at this chart and I made it, every you see the the tendency, you have two people really. You have you and me, and that's one group. And the other party is the Lord. And this is the relationship that we had with us and the Lord, except for Mary, except for Rispa. What does she serve as the shadow? And I've been trying to think about this all week. What does Rispa do? What does Mary do? What, what makes her different? What, what, what is the, the, the benefit that we have of having their story? And the more I thought about it, it made me think it's the way you remember it. It's the way that the crucifixion, the atonement, still affects you is because you think about Rispa. If Rispa didn't do what she did, would we remember the story? I don't know if we would. Because what Rispa does is Rispa is a reminder that this atonement that her sons did for the people was not a common thing. These weren't just criminals that were hung up. This wasn't just somebody had killed somebody so they hung them. It wasn't anything like that. These were people that were probably, probably innocent. They may have not even known that Saul had done this to the Gibeonites. Yet they are going to be held responsible for what Saul has done. So what Rispa does is is by going up and lamenting for her children, protecting her children's bodies, she makes it holy. She makes it something different, something set apart. So if you walk by these seven sons hung up on these trees every day, and you're an Israelite, eventually I think you would stop looking at them. You walk by them every day. Okay, I know that this happened, but you know what, the famine's not here anymore. Okay. And maybe a little bit more every day you forget about what they did for you. They forget that these people atone for Saul's sin. Now, but if Rispa's up there, and every day you see Rispa, and she's moving around, she's interacting with the bodies, you see her beat a vulture off one of the bodies, you see her beat a dog off, you see her up there crying, you see her up there with this sackcloth, it makes you remember it, and it makes it stand out. And that's what Rispa does. She shows that this atonement wasn't something to be discarded. This is something that she showed her care for, hopefully so you would show your care for. And this is what happens, right? We see that in David. In 2 Samuel 21, after Rispa said that in verse 10, it says in verse 11, And David was told what Rispa, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. So she did bring attention to the tree. She did bring attention to the point that David wanted to do something about it. And this is what Mary does as well. Mary is a reminder that this atonement was not a common thing. This wasn't something that that just was to be uh, discarded. This wasn't just a common criminal dying on the cross. To the Romans it was. It was just another person that the Jewish people wanted dead. They wanted to please him, so they killed him. 
But to Mary, it wasn't about that at all. Because Mary actually knew, and she can be a witness through her story, through the gospel, to show that this was different. This was so much different. We hate it when our children are punished for something they don't do. Maybe you've experienced this in school, but you hear out that your child's been punished for something, but you may find out that your child's actually innocent of the punishment, and you get very, very upset. You get very, very angry. The first time I've really seen this happen in my life was happened to my sister. She was in high school. And apparently there was somebody that was uh, hazing or attacking uh, some boy, a freshman, through text messages. And she was... Uh, belittling him and calling him things through these text messages and it was anonymous and it was a very, very terrible thing to do and it was really ridiculous in its core. But the boy found out and decided to tell his mother that it was happening. So the mother gets on the phone and calls the the person that's been hazing him, attacking him and says, you know, what's your name? And the person says, well, my name is Sarah Smith. When we find out the person is lying, there's 15 Sarah Smiths at Prattville High School. She just picked a name. But for some reason, this police officer and the vice principal decided that it was Sarah, my sister. Sarah had nothing to do with it. Sarah didn't even know about it. But they call her in. They won't let her leave. The cop's yelling at her. And basically they're saying, you know, we know you've already did it. You're going to be punished for this. Hey, you can actually face jail time for this. That sort of stuff. And I've never seen my dad more angry and upset than when that happened. Because they were accusing his child of something that she didn't do. And eventually, Dad gets the vice principal to to apologize. The cop is conveniently absent through that process. But regardless, he got it taken care of. But you can see how mad that would make somebody. Then you picture Mary. Do you understand how upset and angry she would be that someone who was completely innocent, her child, was having to be punished for something he didn't do? Take that emotion and just go to this. What it is, is this is Deuteronomy 21. And I want us to actually turn there and read it now. Deuteronomy 21. This is about what happens to a disobedient son. This is where we get the phrase, Cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. Deuteronomy 21. Verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who has not chastened him will not heed him. Then his father and his mother should take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, The son is our stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, he is to be put to death, and you shall hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. I'm sure that Mary knew of Deuteronomy 21 when she was watching her son, Hank. And you have to just imagine here her situation. If a man has a stubborn or rebellious son, deserving of death, they are to be hung on a tree. My son is the opposite of this. Jesus, my son, has been obedient his entire life. My son is the son of God. He's never done anything wrong in his entire life. By the time he was 12, he knew the law better than I did. And he's the one that has to be hung on a tree? You see how unfair, how wrong, how messed up. Why is this happening? Why is someone this innocent having to die? And we know why. Because that stubborn and that rebellious son, that's not describing Jesus. That's describing me. I'm the one who's been disobedient to the Father. I'm the one who's deserving to die. But just like David did, God decided, the Father decided to spare me. To spare me so someone else could be hung on a tree. And Mary can attest to that. Mary's the one that understood that. She understood that this was different, that this was special. I want to look at Hebrews 10, 26. What you have here in Hebrews is you have Jews who wanted to go back to the old law. 
They wanted to go back to the blood of bulls and goats. They wanted to go back to the temple. And what you have is the people, if they leave Jesus, Christian Jews leave Jesus, and go back to the temple to look for forgiveness of sins, they're having to trample over Jesus to get back there. And he's asking, why do you choose this when you have Jesus that's been offered to you? Verse 26. For if anyone, if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remain a sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of three or two witnesses. And that's true. If you were an Israelite and you rejected the law of Moses, you were stoned to death. So he asks here the question in verse 29 of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be who thought worthy who trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What he explains is this concept is, is Jesus is the only one who can atone for your sins. He's the only one that has forgiveness. He's it. That's the only way. So if you reject Jesus, if you don't accept His grace, if you don't accept His atonement, where else are you going to get it? You can't. If you reject Jesus, you will never get forgiveness because He's the only one that can give it to you. He is the only one. So do you consider the covenant, the blood of Jesus to be unholy? Do you think that it's not important? Do you think it cannot save you? Don't be those people. Because all those people that believe that it can't save you, that it can't atone for your sins, is wrong. They're absolutely wrong. And so when you do sin willfully as a Christian, you sin rejecting Jesus. If you're a person that has never accepted Jesus, but instead you just think something else is going to forgive you of sins, your good works aren't going to give you forgiveness, are they? There's something required for a Christian, but they don't give you forgiveness. Not forsaking the assembly, being here all the time. That doesn't give you forgiveness either. Only Jesus can give you forgiveness. So when you reject Jesus, you don't accept what he offers you. You're going right over him. And you're never going to get forgiveness because you've rejected the one thing that can give it to you. And then you have Mary and Rispa. Could you go up to God? Could you go up to the Father and say, I'm sorry, but I don't want the grace that your son offers? Could you go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I know you died for me. I know you went through all this, but I don't want to accept what you have to offer. And I think this is where the perspective really comes in. Could you go up to Rispa? Or could you go up to Mary? Because you go back in time and stand by her on the cross and says, Mary, I don't want to accept what your earthly son has to offer. Could you tell Mary that her son died in vain from your perspective? I don't believe we could. I believe it was impossible. But when you reject Jesus, when you don't accept what he has to offer, that's what you're doing. You're saying it's not important. It's just common. You're saying, I don't really think it can save me because obviously I'm not jumping on it. I don't really believe it. That's what you're doing. You're not accepting the grace of Jesus. So look at one more shadow and substance. The hill that the seven sons die on. It's Golgotha, isn't it? That's where Jesus died. Rispa's sackcloth that she lays out, what does the sackcloth represent? It represents repentance. Godly sorrow, that's what you did. You get a sackcloth and put it on you when you want to repent, when you have that godly sorrow that we talked about last Sunday night. The reason why I said that I believe the famine was a drought is because of the reason why Rispa decided to leave, when she left. It says that she left when the late rains fell down from heaven. Now what I would think the rain would be is the rain would be salvation. Maybe somebody could argue with me and say, I don't think that rain is important. And you you don't have to agree with me because I can just go to verse 14 that God heard the prayers. That itself is salvation. That is salvation for the land. Regardless, he saved the land. But the rain, in my perspective, is salvation. 
So this is how you received the rain. That they were saved by water. The famine, the land was saved by water. 1 Peter 3.21, When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Then that's Noah's shadow, that they were saved by water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe Rispa did everything she could for the bodies of her son. Now God, being a shadow of Rispa, did everything he could for his son after he had died. The thing is, is that God had a lot more power than Rispa did. So what God does is God raises his son back from the dead. And I believe Rispa would have done that if she had had the power. But through that resurrection, we had a promise that if you do accept the atonement that Jesus offers. If you do accept the the salvation that Jesus offers through the waters of baptism, you'll receive that resurrection as Jesus did. That all these things, that you don't have to be afraid of falling into the hands of an angry God because you've been spared. You've been saved. You have had salvation through the Redeemer. If there's anyone here tonight And all of this is going to pull into Jared's sermon tonight talking about baptism. But if there is anyone here this morning, but I don't want you to wait till tonight. If there's anyone here this morning that is ready to accept the atonement that Jesus has 